conference the first Tuesday in February, and Lois kind of runs my life for about a week before this. And anyway, she said, you know, why do you guys always uh, have this at the union? And I said, because it's purple, and it's a reunion. I said, a re and I said the reunion is when Wendell Moyer, which we're going to give a scholarship at noon in his name, a former extension specialist here at K-State, was in charge of the swine activity. He goes, what, what we find with Kansas producers and Midwest producers is ever so often, and I know we got text messaging and you can email and some of you will be on your cell phones today, but you guys just want to get together and talk once in a while. And that's what was going on for about oh, 55 minutes out by the coffee and donuts today. It's just what, a big family reunion. We welcome everybody. We have some new members here from across the United States today. Welcome to the K-State Swine Profitability Conference 2013. This conference would not be possible without a lot of sponsorship. And uh, Roy Henry made sure I pointed out that his proceedings are, are in here. But anyway, within the proceedings on the first page, I want to recognize the sponsors that allows us to bring in world-class speakers. These include the Kansas Pork Association, Tim Strode, Jody, the crew out there, College of Veterinary Medicine, Heartland Animal Manure Management, Joel Derushi is a big part of that group, and then a lot of our other industry fr friends, the Animal Health International Company, Alanco Animal Health, Fourth and Pomeroy Clay Center, Janetta Pork, Mid Midwest uh, Livestock, and they've actually been a sponsor since the first year we had the Profitability con Conference. Pfizer Animal Health, thank you very much, Doug, and your crew, and Soother Feeds, Jerry, and the crew up at, at, at Frankfurt. And without those people, the 27th Annual Swine Profitability Conference would not be possible. We wouldn't be able to bring in these world-class speakers from across the United States. Please join me in giving our sponsors a round of applause. I want to talk briefly, we used a slide at Swine Day, and it's probably one of my favorite slides in a long time because what we're finding in the world today is over time productivity has to continue to increase if we're going to feed the world. And many of you in your business, I know some of you are consultants to these businesses, realize that progress continues to have to be made in order to feed the world population. And I've talked to a lot of older people the last um, couple years about the trend in technology and they talk about how rapid it was you know prior to 2010 and we've got a lot of people responsible for that but the big worry and politically this is becoming a big issue is the technology gap that's starting to occur in animal agriculture as well as plant agriculture whereby there's a lot of concern about in years moving forward if there's going to be enough food available for the population of this world. And that's why people like you are so important, and many of you consultants of the industry, making a difference, keeping it moving forward, making the progress that we have to make to feed the world. And, and, and there's a lot of people in years previous to this that, that are, were instrumental in uh, getting a lot of it done that's got us up to 2013 Swine Profitability Conf Conference. And I don't know what this slide is. I don't know. Did somebody have a birthday here recently? Uh, who's pointing? How, why is everybody pointing to Steve Henry? Steve? One of the legends of the industry, right? 65, what, January 18th? Was that the big party? Did you eat all those cupcakes? Let's give him a round of applause. You know, you talk about that technology gap. Boy, in Kansas, we've been blessed, haven't we? The guy that's done it for so many years. I sent him a note on his birthday. I said, I hope you don't have a midlife crisis this year. You know, so 130 years later, he's going to be going strong. But anyway, we put together a program, our swine team here, that we think is instrumental and, and helpful. We try to cover the gamut. And I know there's an audience here that's diverse in terms of their interest in the Profitability Conference. We're proud this morning to have Jeff DeMann. I'm going to introduce him in a minute. Roy con Joanne into helping him with his talk. And we're really pleased to have Joanne and Roy as the second part of the talk. And then we're going to finish up with the CEO of the National Pork Board, Chris Novak. And, and I had dinner with Chris last night. It's just instrumental, all the great things that are going on nationally. And there's so much. And, and again, Steve taught me early on, you know, worry about within the farm gate. But there's so much in this industry today that happens outside the farm gate. And Chris is going to enlighten us on that 
uh, as the last speaker. And then for housekeeping, Lois said to make sure I tell you this, we're going to go up the main ballroom, and we're going to have a little program there. We're going to give the Wendell Moyer Scholarship, sponsored by the Kansas Pork Association. Got a great recipient, and I think you guys will enjoy uh, hearing her talk over the lunch hour. And then we're going to finish up with the legend, Ron Plain. You know, he just continues to put out great information from the University of Missouri and wrap up with the, the original Trent Luce. And uh, that should be enlightening and fun and, and uh, really what we try to do is work within the economics, within swine production, within animal welfare, within the environment, give you a little bit of everything during the breaks, uh, during lunch, go ahead and catch up with the, the other experts here, the consultants, your fellow producers, and find out what you really want to know about this year's uh, 2013 Swine Profitability Conference. So let's kick it off. Our first speaker, uh, I was really delighted when I, when I called Jeff DeMint. You know, it's getting harder in our industry to find people that want to get up before groups for a variety of reasons and talk about what they're doing either with their business and with their consulting, with their allied industry relationships. And when I call Jeff DeMint, it's the same way he's always been. He goes, sure, I'll do that. I mean, I think we were on the phone for like 45 seconds, Jeff. I didn't have to beg, you know, like Roy just beat me to a threads. But I didn't have to beg you. I didn't have to, you said, I'd love to do that. And so I'm delighted to have one of our own. Jeff went to vet school. I knew him a little bit through school. He graduated, I think, in 1990, College of Veterinary Medicine in every veterinary association that uh, uh, pertaining to pigs that you can think of. And we ask uh, him to talk today to give the special Jack and Pat Anderson lecture. And we ask him, and you can see it in the program as well, to talk about the five key areas to change in production management that needs to be made to improve profitability. So Jeff, welcome back to K-State. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you for having me here today. Thanks to the swine group. And the conversation was a little bit different when Jim called, but I remember it because it was stunned silence on my side after I said yes. Because the next thing out of his mouth was, we wanted to talk about five things that are profitable in the swine industry. This was the first week of August, 107 degrees, hadn't rained in a month, no crops, no work for veterinarians, and we're talking about profitability. So I, I that was why it didn't last very long, because I just stood there and stunned like, you're nuts. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I w the world-class speakers will be here soon. I'll get through with this quick so we can get to them. But um, one thing that we have to remember is out-of-pocket expenses. The, um, the things we're going to talk about today, circovirus vaccine, your feed, um, your management skills, they don't write you a check at the end of the week or the end of the month. These are inherent in the cost of when you market that animal. And so you don't see that cost. It's an out-of-pocket expense, but it's an unrecognized uh, response. So through the research at Kansas State and other people, we get to see what that response is uh, without doing the research ourselves. So, um, so when I was, after this talk with Jim, I started thinking about how do you do profitability. So I started thinking back to my physics days. And uh, a car accelerates when it slows down, it's acceleration in a negative direction. So by the same way, if we're down here at $4 losing per head and I move you to the minus two, you made profit. And so maybe right now we're just going to try to go from a negative to a less of a negative. We're going to call that profit today. Um, if you add these all up, maybe we can get you up to the positive numbers, but um, we'll see what happens. I started practice with Dr. Boomer in Burn, Kansas, 20 three years ago almost now, and there was two things he told me when I first started, and these have been edited, but I'm going to tell you now because it's not being recorded. Uh, I, put in, <laughs> I put in raised pigs here. He said farmers. But he said farmers can farm as piss poorly as their equity will allow them. And so you clean that up and you say people can raise pigs as poorly as their equity will allow them. It has nothing to do with health, welfare, anything about how you treat the animals. It's what do you want back in your life? Uh, sometimes you're not willing to give up uh, lifestyles, working on Sundays, uh, to chase every dollar that's out there. So uh, you can do it as, as poorly, that's the word there, as you want. Um, the other thing he told me is you can, uh, 
raise pigs however you like, but when things start going bad, remember the rules and go back to them. So uh, there's more than the dairies, but uh, it raise, works on pigs too. If you have a purge outbreak, remember your biosecurity. Go back. If you don't want to change boots in the wintertime because it's hard putting on cold, hard boots, it's a pain. But when you have a purge outbreak, go back to the rules. So we're going to talk about some of the rules today. Uh, this is the Flint Hills sunset. I didn't take it, so but uh, nice thing to kind of look at here. So the five things that I chose to talk about, some are pretty broad. Uh, nutrition, uh, biosecurity. When I talk about biosecurity today, I'm going to talk about PERS. Uh, another product we're going to talk about is Improvest, a broad topic, guilt pool management. That's a, a week-long seminar. We're going to do it in six minutes. Um, vaccination and management of circovirus vaccine. Uh, when I talk about vaccination and management, it's going to be over circo vaccine. So the first one, nutrition. I'm the last person who should be standing here talking about nutrition at Kansas State University. Um, it, it's such a high cost in your field today, representing about 70% seven, of your cost. Uh, you need for professional people to take care of this for you. Uh, many swine producers are very familiar with feeding swine and they can do it and they're good at it. They have good resources at Kansas State and other places to get that information. Um, with that, recommend a professional, whether it be an industry, academia, uh, one of the allied industries. But a few things that I gleaned from Swine Day this year and some other things is, uh, this was at Swine Day, what is feed efficiency doing for us? At 350 pounds per ton of feed, each uh, one-tenth, one-hundredth of a movement on feed efficiency is worth 46 cents according to John Patient. The Kansas State Swine website said it's somewhere between 30 and 45 cents. So we're kind of in the same neighborhood uh, depending on when you uh, did the calculations. So uh, through the presentation, we'll kind of remember and refer back to this at about 45 cents. So what's the value of feed efficiency? And this is from Swine Day also. If the whole nationwide feed efficiency is 3 to 1, and we can go from a 3.0 to a 2.9 feed efficiency, then it's worth 140,000 tons of feed at a cost of $28 million. That makes up a little bit of that room, that technology that Jim talked about. We have some feed that we can do other things with. And so it, it's, this is not really a, a massive technology thing, but there's things in technology that will make this happen. So a lot of money, a lot of feed. And this, in these times when we don't have a lot of feed, that's needed. The people that are doing yourself, I've got this. I'm, I, I don't use it very much. I use it more probably in cattle. But the um, Grain Council puts out a, a new one this, this past year on DDGs. It has all the information you're ever going to want on it. The website's there. Use it uh, if you're going to do your own uh, nutrition work. So this is put out by John Patience also, and it's what the cost of energy has done. You've used G DDGs in the past few years as a commodity. Uh, this is showing energy cost in 2005, what it cost, versus 2012. You can see the difference in corn uh, and the difference here in DDGs. When you do a little bit of math, it comes out about 415% increase in corn cost and about a 550% increase in DDG cost for that. So it's kind of flip-flopping the values there over the past. So all those feed costs, what does it actually come out to, to mean to you? Uh, from 2000 to 2007, feed costs ran in the low 30s to mid 45, uh, between 50 and 260 pounds of feed cost. Now we're at 104, it's probably a little more than that actually, but uh, a two and a half times increase in just the last five years. So that's the other reason why we need to take advantage of the technology. From Swine Day this year, particle size, every 100 micron reduction in particle size is what's worth 1.3% of feed efficiency. Um, using today's price, that's $1.35 a pig. So that's, you can just put 135 in, in there. You won't get a check for it, but it's in the value of that pig. Uh, this is some research that was presented there. 
uh, on nursery diets the first 21 days, and it's basically what we know is pelleting gives you an increase in uh, revenue per pig and uh, income or feed cost in this trial. Uh, grinding, grinder, uh, finer than 620 microns or the components does not improve pig performance or income or feed cost, but pelleting, most people feed pellets, it does have a, a, an improvement on pig performance and economic return. So, uh, the finishing diet, this was from uh, day zero to 111, whoop, 111 days, uh, reducing particle size from 650 to 320. Did not have an effect on average daily gain or average daily feed intake. It did improve feed to gain, caloric efficiency, feed cost per pound to gain, and income or feed cost. And again, stated a different way, every thousand or hundred micron reduction in particle size is about 1%. So that's from a 3.0 to a 2.99. Uh, difference there. Fine grinding entire diet was detrimental to performance, carcass characteristics, economics, and fed meal, but improved economic return when pelleted. So, um, one thing I always remember, and I don't know if it's totally true anymore, but we want it fine in the nursery. As we get into the grower, we want it to be just a little bit coarser, let the stomach kind of heal up just a little bit, and then we put it to them in the finisher. We, we get it, we grind it again, we get it fine, because that's where the feed cost really comes into play. So I think most of that, as a general rule, is kind of there still. So this is kind of a, a budgeted spreadsheet here, a feed budget. Uh, this is what uh, is currently being done. Uh, it takes about 590 pounds. Uh, if you reduce down, to, down 300 microns from 700 to 400, you'll use about 23 pounds less. So over that barn of a thousand pigs, use about 11 tons less feed, which ends up being about four dollars a pig difference. So we're not writing checks, but we're get we're cashing them right there. Um, another way to kind of look at it on a on a barn basis, uh, if you follow your microns down wherever you're at today, so probably in here, if you get down into this area on a thousand head finisher turn. Uh, there's your difference between six and eight thousand dollars if you get down to that four to five hundred micron size. One other thing that we can save feed on without costing ourselves too much is um, withdrawing feed pre slaughter. Uh, don't put the expensive feed on the floor at the slaughter plant. Withdraw feed for 18 hours prior to slaughter. Uh, it's easy to do on closeout loads, you just shut off the feed system. The challenge gets to be when you have pre-closeouts or partial closeouts, you got to either close off the feeder somehow, shut them off uh, with gates, without water access, so you don't stop water access, and, or just shut off the feed, the pins that uh, are going to be sold. Remember, if you shut off feed to the whole barn, Dr. Henry taught us this 25 years ago, in just a couple hours, four to six hours, we can get ulcers. And those pigs, if we, we hold feed off of them. Uh, hemorrhagic bowel is also a, a consequence of shutting off the feed. Uh, it generally shows up after they go back on feed. So, two things that if you start seeing this, you have, you're starting to have some feed, or feed outage problems. Uh, this is just a rock landscape in the um, Flint Hills. And then on the other side of that, there's this carving. And this is how I know it's world world-class swine group here because this is on the other side we have Jim and Mike and Joel and then Bob and it, it's not on the picture but Steve Dries was right over here somewhere <laughs> so and yes this was close to Jim's backyard so we don't know how it was put there or whatever but uh, well, it, it's a, what's amazing is how well that forehead fits this forehead and that mustache there was no question about where they're going to go. Okay. Okay. So one of the newer technologies that's out there that has not been implemented very much is Improvest. Improvest is a, it's a process from the old Pfizer company. And I was told that it's old Pfizer now because of Friday, so I didn't know that. But what we just talked about, major challenges facing the pork industry, we just talked about it's feed, we get feed costs. Environmental issues, like Jim was talking about, uh, 
the carbon problems, and what do the, the consumers think about pork that we're serving them today and we're, we're growing for them today. So what Improvest is, it's an FDA, it's, it's a lot of stuff, it's an FDA approved veterinary prescription product that is safe and effective alternative to surgical castration to manage boar taint. Um, they don't, whoops, they don't like that word, but it's all, it's for the temporary immunological castration. It suppresses testicular function of male pigs, uncastrated, uh, a redu reduction of boar taint, and so we can eat them as boars. Uh, the inherent value of raising boar pigs, uh, reduced mortality associated with physical castration, no infections, no ruptures, uh, nothing like that. Improved feed efficiency, uh, greater quantity of lean pig per carcass, and we have improved environmental profile because we're using less feed. However, there are some potentials of off-order issues if it's not done correctly, and that's some of the concerns of the consumer and also the packer. So how it works, Improvest is a protein the compound looks like works like an immunization. It's injected into the boar pigs. Uh, it uses the pig's immune system to tie up GnRH to temporarily create the same effect as physical castration, but it happens much later in life in the male's pig, so we allow them to grow as a, a boar pig longer where they're more efficient. So if you look at the pig head here, tail back here, the brain produces a chemical called GnRF, gonadotropin releasing factor. It goes to the pituitary. It stimulates the production of two hormones, luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating, follicle stimulating hormone. They circulate the body. They go to the liver. They go to the small, the large intestine. They produce a chemical that's part of bortain, ketol. It also goes to the testicles, and when it's there, it causes steroids to be produced, endosterone. Uh, they have behavior increase, libido, and fertility of a boar pig. Uh, the combination of this chemical and that chemical is boar taint. And that's one of the things it does is eliminates the production of those. And the way it does it is you give two injections in this pig's life. It produces anti-GNRF antibodies that circulate through the, through the body and the bloodstream. So when the hypothalamus produces GNRF, it interrupts this signal to stimulate LH, FSH, and so we do not get the, as much production of skatol and anisterone who don't have the fertility, the increased libido, or increased boar behavior that we would with a normally intact male. Um, the results in the same impact on meat quality as a physically castrated animal. So what is Improvest? It's a protein compound, it is not a hormone. It's an immunological comp, uh, product. It's not chemical castration. It's temporary in effect. It's not genetically modified. We're using the pig's own immune system. It is not a growth promoting like we have out in the, uh, it is given by subcutaneous injection, it's not added to feed. So this is the difference of a 280 to 300 pound boar without Improvest, the testicular size. This is the testicular size when they've been injected properly with Improvest. So as an efficient as uh, physical castration, we call boar things, they grow as nature intended, uh, allowed to grow as an intact male later in life. With that, you get a, a reported 1.6% lower mortality than physical castration. Uh, the pigs are less aggressive because they're not boar pigs. So they ha behave similar to barrows. Uh, is not intended for females, obviously. Uh, barrows or male pigs intended for breeding. Although it is considered temporary, it's on label still that it's not for breeding animals. So these are supposed to be videos, but it's not going to work. But you can see this boar here, an impact male, riding has more testicular volume than here, barrows laying around being happy eating. So FDA says that this product is efficacious and safe for both the animal, the food safety, environment, and manufacturing. The USDA side of it uh, is saying that it's, it's safe 
at the packer and to go on to the consumer. So that's uh, Pfizer company in the past. Now these intact males that are injected with Improvest will go to slaughter and the USDA will consider them to be barrows, even though they have testicles in their body still. So uh, they're an uncastrated male going into the food chain, but the USDA will consider them as a barrow for the for, for slaughter. So then what happens to the pork? How does it change? Uh, the consistency and the quality of the pork is the same as today, the same as if you physically castrate them. Consumers don't see a difference in the taste. They can't detect the difference between the improvised pig and the castrated pig. Uh, 20 countries, uh, they've used it, uh, the quality, reported the meat measurements, quality attributes are the same. So where is it being used? Uh, it's approved and safe, and if you look down here at the thing, uh, United States, North America, 2011, uh, Australia down here, 2005 or before. So we're kind of the, the last, the slow adapting people of the technology. And even though it's here, we're still slow in the technology uptake of this product. Um, but the, the people, I think, that are hungry in the world, I think they're using it. And, to their advantage uh, and to our detriment right now. It's approved safe and effective in 62 countries, and that includes the European Union, uh, Japan, and um, it's sold under Improvac. There's no export restrictions, there's zero withdrawal uh, in all markets in, in the world. No residues from the meat that could affect human health. So what's the value in doing this? Uh, six to ten percent improvement in feed efficiency. Um, I think the National Hog Farmer three weeks ago was set up to fifteen percent. You need it if you're there, probably. But ten uh, percent, ten percent at forty-six cents is four sixty. If we do it here at thirty cents, we're buck eighty on the very low end. At six percent, and the lowest end is is dollar eighty. So on that, we got two to four and a half dollars improvement. Average daily gain, 4.2% increase in average daily gain, two to two and a quarter or half percent increase in yield. Uh, I think in some of the Kansas State research at Swine Day, this didn't always pan out. Um, Improvest eliminates the risk of physical castration, so you end up with a 1.6 lower mortality from your ruptures, your infections, um, strips, whatever that happened as a consequence of castrating them. And then again, pigs that are given improvised act like a barrow. So I'm not a big environmentalist. I'm getting to be more because like Jim talked about, we need to put that gap. So when you talk to me about the gap in technology, I get to on board a lot more with it. So what are the benefits of using this product environmentally? It decreases the carbon footprint research has 3.7 percent reduction potential in co2 output equivalent per kilogram of pig live weight so that, that extra feed there again we can grind it finer even and we can get more benefit twice on that feed so how do we work use this product um, it's basically two injections you give one after nine weeks of age the priming dose four weeks later you come back and give another one after four weeks Within, after two weeks after the second dose, you do a quality inspection, uh, make sure they're acting like barrows, they didn't get missed, you don't have the behaviors of the libido, the, the riding, the boar tank smell. And then you can sell them anytime, three to ten weeks after that second dose. Um, and when they go, they'll have this quality assurance certificate that we showed on the USDA that says these are barrows for marketing purposes. So that's the... Uh, process of doing it. Here's how they do it. It's a syringe, a safety syringe. It's kind of like a nail gun. Depress this part of the, against the pig's body. Pull the, depress this trigger here and allows you to uh, depress the plunger and administer the dose. Um, if you've ever used a microtill gun, it's very similar. It, it takes some practice to use it, but uh, it does have a guard on the needle. 
uh, for human sake because there are some human uh, concerns of this product. Uh, but people who use this will be trained to work in fair, uh, finishing units because they're going to be using them on bigger pigs. They're not going to be picking these pigs up and shooting them. They're going to be walking around in the, in the pens. Uh, they're going to be 150 pounds, possibly. Uh, care should be not to have self-administration. And basically the rule is if you inject yourself once with this product, you don't handle it again. If you're a pregnant woman, you don't handle it. Uh, and if you're of childbearing age, you shouldn't handle it. Uh, because we also produce the GNRF in our body, and we assume that it will also block that in our body if you get a second dose. We assume it's temporary, but I don't know who's doing that work. Um, I know some people we could use it on, but uh, that's another topic. Uh, so what's the value of it? Dr. Dreet in 2011 that's worth five dollars over over the cost of the medication over the vaccination. Another seventy-five cents if you feed uh, the step lysine levels. Uh, I think it's probably more than that right now. Uh, this is probably from uh, early uh, to mid uh, 2011, but um, I think it could be more. So there's six dollars. The obstacles for using Improvest. Uh, there's a few. Meat packers have been slow to adapt this technology. They don't want these pigs right now. We don't have any place to take them. Uh, we have to change our diets uh, to feed them differently because we're feeding boars physiologically for a lot longer than we uh, would barrows. We're feeding the males longer as males, not in time over time. We have to, re that's, this one here I think is going to be a, a, a crucial one is getting responsible and accurate injection crews to administer this product. If it's on your farm and you're doing it, that's fine. Uh, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of injecting. Uh, but, and it has, it, I, I put down that this is a rigid, flexible system. It allows you some windows of when you can do it, but it's very rigid when you have to do it because it doesn't work if you do it um, at three weeks and then probably do it again at 25 weeks and try to stop it. it you got some rules in there the way it's labeled uh, after nine weeks and then four, at least four weeks later. Uh, there are some human health risks. Uh, if everybody starts injecting themselves acting like this, we won't have injection crews because nobody will be able to use it. And probably the one that's still out there and that's what scares these people is the acceptance and education of the consumer. Uh, will they accept this technology? Uh, we have to convince them that it's safe and wholesome, the food that they're going to generate from that, from that product. I read this paper. It's, it's at the website at Kansas State. This has some of the characteristics of the lysine and what they found with it. I didn't want to try to sub, uh, summarize this for you, but you have people out here who know the lysine levels that you need to feed. Uh, they work for Pfizer. They work for Kansas State. They work for... Hubbard, Prina, who are out there. So visit with them. If you're doing it yourself, go to the website, read this paper. Uh, this is my practice area. This is just a mile from my house. It's a beautiful country. Um, so biosecurity, we're going to talk about PERS. And the reason we're going to talk about PERS is I really think this should say stop, keep PERS out. As when it comes to it, I don't think there's anything else we need to talk about because if we protect our swine operation from PERS, I think the rest of the virus and the bacteria most of the time will take care of themselves. I know the foreign animal diseases maybe are more important, but this is more of a threat. So uh, most biosecurity threats come from breeding stock additions, your neighbor's pigs, and the pigs that are being transported by and around your farm. So you can control this one, and you can't control those two. Um, and this is part of every PQA plus certification. So hopefully everybody's seen this in their lifetime, and it's important enough that the pork board put it as number one B. So it is important. It's good production practice number one. Um, they haven't broke out here as external and internal. It's in your book. Um, we're going to cover most of these, but we're going to talk about them specifically for PERS. That's general there. Uh, so biosecurity PERS prevention. I think it's a major threat to the swine industry. It costs us about $664 million annually. That's a lot of dollars per pig. 
Um, pigs are the only animals that become infected with PERS. And I think that's important to remember is where did I get this from? It came from pigs. How it got there is the other question, but it came from pigs. Uh, bodily fluids, most all bodily fluids, as well as semen, can be infected with PERS. So we, we have a potential to bring this in uh, every day. This is the Bible on PERS, as far as I'm concerned. And I think the swine veterinarians agree because it's on their uh, publication on their website. This is Scott D. and his group, Biosecure Protocols for Prevention of Spread of PERS. The website, is, it's in your proceedings, so it's, I think everybody, it's 20 pages. It has all the questions that you want and know. And if you ask me, I refer to this. Um, so I'm going to summarize this for you here pretty quickly because we're going to run short of time. But uh, it's host specific. No other mammal, insect, or avian species serves as a biological vector. They can be a mechanical vector, but not a biological vector. It means it doesn't reproduce in that animal. This is some of the most questions I get about PERS. Months to years, and I'm not an academia, so I put things in Fahrenheit and yards and feet. Four degrees, minus four degrees. That's cold. We're not going to see too much of that. But months to years, six days at 21 degrees, which is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a nice spring day. 24 hours at body temperature. 20 minutes on a hot, hot day. Um, if you can keep it moist, meaning it's not hot uh, or drying out, 11 days, long time. Uh, this one here, seven days in refrigerated meat, uh, months in frozen meat. If you infect, if you butcher an infected animal and make pork chops out of it, refrigerated for a week, uh, frozen for months. So people that are butchering their own pigs at home or some of your finishing units, don't let them bring those products in and eat them around the pigs if they're going to be negative. This one here, I think, is the one that's still the most important to us. Uh, if you think about swine day, that's the beginning of purr season around here. And one of the last things we do before we come to swine day is we pump the lagoon. And then we all come together, and we spread and share all that lagoon, and we take it back. Well, it can, it can last a long time, 68 degrees, which most swine days we're going to be in this area. So we could spread a bunch of this if we go to our farms for days on um, highways, the parking lots, on our boots. Um, I was thinking about this, how many people went to their farm just to check something today. It was cold. See if somebody showed up to work or something and then drove here today. And you're, we're all mingled around and how many people will wash their vehicle or will wash it before they go home. Um, we don't have the snow right now, but if it's colder, you can, it can last for a while. Composting of carcasses inactivates PERS virus. So there's no reason to have them picked up. Uh, isolation, 130 yards off-site. Keep them isolated for 30 days, monitoring for diseases and PERS. Um, testing, they, blood testing the PCR for PERS has been kind of the standard in the past. I think the ropes are, ropes are becoming the more standard now and they can be substituted. Um, if the breeding stock's not bleeding them before they, you get them, you need to monitor them and either hang a rope or bleed them when they first come in, watch them for a month, and then hang a rope before you put them in your, in your uh, herd for your own biosecurity. Because even if they bleed them back here before they leave the farm, we still don't control that transportation. Wherever they come from to when they get to the farm, how many people they pass, how many places do they go. Um, so we still have to protect ourselves by checking them again. Um, so acclimation, once they're there, we want to vaccinate them, give them animal exposure or serum inoculation. Uh, that time period lasts somewhere between 30 and 120 days, depending on what you're doing. Uh, with serum inocul inoculation of PERS, it's going to be longer uh, for that. So figure out how it's going to be and when you want to breed them and work back. Um, downtime, uh, Dr. D and his group says one night downtime is sufficient between going farm to farm. Uh, industry basically says two days, maybe three days. Uh, this is probably enough, but err on the side of caution. We try to, but if you have to, one night. Showers will decontaminate a person. And probably the most common 
is, is the day and age. The only way the shower, I think, really works it real great is it makes you take your clothes off. Uh, and the Dane system does the same thing. You wash your hands, you take your boots and coveralls off, you put on new ones, and you don't break, you break the transmission first. You can use gloves and sanitizers also to kill it. Use foreign-specific boots and coveralls or disposable coveralls and boots um, and keep them clean. Um, we, you know, inside boots, outside boots uh, are getting to be more common. Mechanical vectors we talked about, insects, other animals can carry this virus for a short amount of time, but it does not reproduce in them. Um, but you can also, like your supplies, your medications, they can bring it in. So uh, double bag them. Uh, outside bag stays outside. The inside bag goes in with the, whatever you're bringing in. If you're going to disinfect them, you need five minutes. If you're going to, and then they need to be dried for two hours. This is the Flint Hills. I don't get to practice here. So vaccination management protocols with Circovax. And I'm going to talk about this one um, for this vaccine only. And I'll tell you a reason why here. Um, a significant amount is used to raise pigs. It probably, we spend somewhere between 3 and $4 a pig for water medication, feed medication, vaccinations, iron, all that. So whatever your total is there. Some people are much less, some people are much more. The uh, level, you know, PK Plus has standard operating procedures for vaccination of breeding herds, non-breeding herds, and farm medication. Um, use those. And when, when they are filled out on a farm, it's because they've always done it that way. But make sure we're reviewing these annually or when you have a significant health challenge. We change them on a monthly basis, it seems like. Because anytime we have a clostridium outbreak or a rotavirus, we're feeding back now or we're not feeding back now. We're giving antibiotics or not giving antibiotics. So for the young people here that don't have a whole lot of bacteriology or virology experience, and you're talking to your veterinarian or your dad or your brother or your hired man, this is how you decide how bad a disease is. Coccidia, the response from the person will be, oh. You say strep suis, they'll say, okay. You say E. coli, they say, oh, well. You say rotavirus, oh, really. You say pastorella, you say, oh, no. Parasuis, oh, crap. APP, oh, my God. And you get PERS, and you say, oh, fart. For some reason, they maybe blank that out, but when you hear that one, this is that's a bad one. So, if you're standing around and you're trying to learn how bad diseases are, I just use this scale to figure out how bad they are. And if you listen to your clients and your other producers, your dad or your brother-in-laws, whatever, uh, listen to the veterinarian when they start telling them what these are, and listen to the response, and you'll know how bad it is and how many times you have to change your boots and coveralls for the next five months. Uh, vaccination management protocols, it's in the PQA book. Uh, they have them for different medications. This is one that we make up. Um, I've heard 97% of the pigs in the United States are vaccinated for circovirus. I question myself is why aren't 100% of them done? That means about 3.6 million pigs are not vaccinated for circovirus. Uh, some of them are in this room because I work for them. Uh, the cost of doing it is a dollar and a half to two dollars however you're buying it. Um, and the thing I hear from everybody is it's only 5% of the pigs that get infected with it. We're not seeing the 40% death loss like we used to see. Why am I spending this $2 a pig? Uh, I don't think it matters which vaccine you use. Just use one that fits best in your operation. Different sizes. You can mix them, different volumes, uh, different protocols. So use one. Dr. Henry stood up here. I think it was profitability in 2007. I couldn't find the quote, but I found this article. Uh, Steve Henry, a great source, he said it's never been lower. Return on investment never been lower than two to one. Often reaches four to one to seven to one. Two dollars, four to one. That's eight dollars you get back. They don't write a check for it, but it's in your pig. So this is some of the first stuff that we were presented on economic return on circovirus. Has it stayed the same now that circovirus isn't around? 2011 published in the Journal of Swine Health and Production. Uh, vaccinated pigs deliver return on investment of five ninety per pig over vaccinated pigs, right in line with what Steve found four or five years ago. Um, so what happens if my pigs, I've never seen Circo in my herd, Dr. Waddell, 
uh, pigs that don't show signs of disease, they have a five to one return on this vaccine. So my question is why is there 3.6 million pigs that aren't vaccinated? And you can do it however you want. That's how you can do it. It's as fifth poorly as you want. It has nothing to do with the health of that pig. It's profitability. If you don't want those dollars, you don't have to do it because there are things in your life that uh, take precedent. And I understand that. So I, it, there's no right or wrong answer, but I think if you're looking for the money, it's, it's there. My summary basically is don't stop vaccinating for circle virus to save $2. It's not worth it. Um, we're going we're gonna to hurry through this. This is my cattle working facility. This is just outside my house also. <laughs> so this is about a week and a half to a month worth of presentation right here. And uh, doing this, I found out I know a lot of stuff. I don't know why I know it or who told me or why we do it. Um, and I'm still not sure after I did this. So I'm sure you're not either. So I'm, we're going to go through this quickly here. Guilt pool management. Uh, Dr. Foxcroft, which you're going to see his name a lot. That's spelled out. Okay. Um, he said the relative importance factors influencing the number of pigs weaned per week. The number one thing is number of females served, 60% relevance. Born alive, pre born mortality are 5%. So chasing these isn't going to do near as much as getting the crates filled with sows. Farring rate has about half that response there. So we need to get sows in the crates. In order to do that, we have to have an active guilt pool. The guilt pool makes up 12 to 15 percent of the herd size. It allows us to get 25 percent of our breeding group as gilts. non productive feed costs for a sow, if we say a dollar because it's easy math. Uh, loss of pig production, non productive days, we might be able to get that to two and a half to three dollars per day, uh, depending on what your pig production per sow per year is. And I, I could not find it, and I'm bad at this, and Steve will be able to tell you the page number probably, but. Dr. Gary Dye, I think 20 years ago, told us keep the farrowing crate full is the most important thing to, for profitability. I think it's still true, and I think Dr. Foxcroft showed us that uh, 20 years later. So effective guilt pool management, according to Dr. Foxcroft, imp uh, improves uh, utilization of building space, improves flow of eligible gilts, increases efficiency of labor, uh, increases body condition at first service, reduces annual replacement rates, achieves the desired physiological target of age and size uh, at first service, improves the long-term fitness of the sow, keeps her in the herd longer, and maintains economic efficiency of a small guilt pool because it costs us a dollar a day. Uh, what's, what's needed to develop a good guilt pool is a good genetic supplier of the right, uh, adequate supply of the good genetics and good health. Uh, we've talked about isolation and acclimation with PERS. Uh, so these are kind of things we do. We don't, I don't always know why we do it or why we learned how we learned it, but 20 minutes of boar contact starting when they're 135, 150 days of age, one to two times a day. Direct contact, not fence line contact, direct contact. Get vaccinations done early before, before boar exposure. Give them 12 to 15 uh, square feet of thin space per gilt in groups of 3 to 50, which that's really small and that's really big, but there's no difference otherwise. So the recommendation is keep them in their th uh, thermal neutral area. It's in your PQA book. It's 45 to 70. Remember, during the summertime in Kansas, heat stress above 80 degrees in just a few hours. So uh, you're going to decrease your guilt pool when that happens. 10 hours of light. I'm not a real big proponent of this one, but uh, it, in the tide doesn't make a, a difference. Breed at 300 pounds at seven and a half to nine months of age with at least one skip heat. That's kind of what we've recommended for, for a number of years. Um, gilts bred at 300 to 350 pounds. Gilts bred under 300 pounds have three less pigs born over three parodies than gilts bred greater than 300 pounds. Um, so that's the target we're shooting for. Uh, this research says there's no advantages to breeding heavier than 310 pounds. So your breeding goal then is between 300 and 310. Make sure you hit it. <laughs> it, it it's, a, it's a hard one, but uh, every time we go above this number here, it costs us non-productive days. Um, Dr. Williams showed here, and once again, I changed it 
This is 300 pounds and under. Uh, here is 350-375, so we're talking in this neighborhood. You can see there's about a three pig difference there. We lose out and we start getting them out here bigger. Breeding gilts by age. So do you do it by age or do you do it by size? You do it by both. Uh, they need to be 300 pounds, but breeding younger, by breeding younger animals, it allows the gilt to be bred on second and third estrus without adding non-productive days. I mean, this is some type, you can argue that this is true or not, um, but delayed breeding until second estrus is believed to increase litter size by seven tenths, eight tenths of a pig. Delaying third estrus only increases about two tenths of a pig. Uh, one thing I'll put to you is with increased feed cost of a gilt at 75 cents per day, is this extra pig worth one heat of $15 or two heats of $30? If your pig's worth $15, you can get this pig, but you can't pay for that. Uh, and going out to four, it costs even more without any benefits. So this is a, a slide from Dr. Levis, 180 gilt. When do they come into heat? The range is 140 to 276. Most of them are right here in this 160, 170 day. Uh, his average was 176, I believe. So this is about the, the time we're choosing them. The more we choose down here, if they're 300 pounds, they're the fastest growing animals. They got there the quickest, the cheapest. Um, and they're the youngest, so we should have the least amount of expense right here. So we want to breed this way and get rid of those. Um, we can't get rid of those, but we need to check it, have a genetic supplier that doesn't give us those. So, uh, gilts bred over 10 months of age. This is old research, but I think it's even more important today with feed costs. They're less efficient. We use bigger pigs born alive over a sow's lifetime, pulled sooner, and showed a negative economic return over their economic life. Um, so this is kind of where I wanted to get to, but uh, the two most common uh, hormonal interventions that we use are PG600, uh, and that's used on gilts before they're cycling to get them to come into heat. These are coming into heat three to seven days after injection. The other one is Matrix, which is an oral progesterone fed to cycling gilts to synchronize their heat cycle. And this is important for the next slide, but this synchronizes the heat cycle. It's fed for 14 days. It shows signs of estrus in four to nine days after the draw it. Um, four dollars, twenty-three dollars. So that fourteen days is twenty-three dollars. So it's doubling your non-productive feed day cost there. Um, so keep that in mind when you, if, you, if you're going to use it. So the one hormone product that it's been out for a number of years that we haven't heard much because I don't think it's out available too much is Ovugel. And this is, we're back to this same little molecule in the body, this GnRH they have on this one, and it acts like it. So we're going to do the opposite of it. This synchronizes ovulation. Where matrix synchronizes estrus, this synchronizes ovulation. And the benefit of this is it allows fixed times insemination. If you guys produce beef cows or dairy cows, you breed those, you synchronize them, you breed them 80 hours, 72 hours after you, after you synchronize them. Everybody gets bred. Um, the benefits of this is it decreases semen usage because with this product they're inseminating one time and they're doing them all at the same time, usually somewhere between 20 and 24 hours. It also allows us to take the best board genetics we have out there and spread them over more places because we're using less dosages. Um, all the gel containing 200 micrograms of tryptorelin given at 120 hours after the last feeding matrix effectively synchronized ovulation after estrus cycle synchronization with matrix. So they're using the two together in this point. It can be used in sows, which I'll show you, by itself. Um, Dr. Fox crossed again. Um, what they took 150 sows, and these sows um, had a 21 day lactation. They weaned 10 and a half pigs, 150 in each group. If you look, the Avi gel, they bred all 150 of them. The number of sows in the control group, they only bred about 83% of them, 123. The number of controls that are in heat were 100% because they bred 100% of them when they're in heat. With the Avi gel, they're not always in heat when you breed them. And what, I don't know if it's coincident or not, but this is 17% and that's 17%. 
So whether they would have been the same, same, same 17 percent, I don't know, but that's significant. The other thing that's significant is the control styles that use 2.3 doses of the semen. Ovi jelly used one, so one time insemination. Pig produce, uh, weaned estrogen interval was about the same. Pigs produced about 75, or sows that feral about 75 percent, about the same. Total born alive numerically significantly about the same. And this is how they're trying to sell this product, and whether it's it's a true way to sell it or not, I'm not, I'm not sure this is a true way to sell it, but. 9.6 pigs per semen dose, 5.3. I've never thought of pigs per semen dose before, but that's how they're selling it. So we're making some uh, new things out there, and it's going to be talked about here in, in a month at Swine Veterinarians Conference. Paul Yeske has a paper, Time Dissemination Following Intervaginal Ovigel Treatment, and uh, another one, of Effectiveness of Ovigel in Commercial Swine Herds in the United States. So the timing, the usage, the dosage is still being used. I think we're going to hear more about this. It just depends if it's, it's cost effective for us. And if, if all the breeding goes right, this is maybe our future right here. A ham pig breeding a cow or making cheeseburgers. So with that, I say thank you to you um, for letting me do this. And you guys teach me every day, and I appreciate it. So thank you. As Jim mentioned, this is the, the Jack and Pat Anderson special lecture in, in, uh, in animal health, and, and we're lucky enough, uh, based on the vision of Jack Anderson, uh, I believe it was in about 1996, he called up one day and, and uh, called me and said he wanted to make some kind of impact for education for veterinarians. And, and uh, we came up with this idea of sponsoring the lecture for, to bring in a, a, a well-recognized veterinarian. And, and uh, so we've been lucky enough to have uh, several very good veterinarians. And, and I'd like to just point out, you know, listening to Jeff's talk here today, you know, he brought up these points that I think really embody uh, what Jack he was a visionary veterinarian, one of the first swine production veterinarians in the U.S. And think about all the points that, that make Dr. DeMint a good veterinarian. He's talking about all kinds of production topics here, not just disease and not just, he did talk a little bit about PERS, I guess, but. Uh, preventing. <laughs> preventing it. You know, and, and, and unfortunately, Dr. Anderson's not here with us anymore. He passed away last May. And, and uh, we really want to thank him uh, for building this enduring legacy here that we're going to have this lecture, you know, for on and on till Jim is continuing on to do this, this, uh, this talk. So we really want to thank you, Jeff, and thank you for, for giving us a great presentation and good to work with you. Thank you, Jim.